It's a beautiful sunny day outside. Welcome all to the uh, Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. This is next to the last summer session. Uh, summer sessions are usually done by the laity of the church and the minister who is here today <laughs> is taking some time off. Next week, our speaker will be Sarah Allen, and her topic is regenerative. Rege I told you guys I took speech for regenerative agriculture. Uh, the service on August 18th is one of my favorites. Reverend Jennifer will return to the pulpit and will be doing the blessing of the animals. And we always say everyone is welcome here, regardless of your race, your ethnic background your gender, your socioeconomic status, your abilities, or your politics. And while we say everyone is welcome, this time of year, on the 18th, everybody is welcome. With four legs, with feathers, with scales, as long as you have a well-behaved pet, you're welcome to bring it to church that Sunday and have it blessed. We are a creedless church. You'll find we don't tell you what to believe. It's often said that you use, don't answer all your questions. Instead, we question all the answers. Uh, just as we cherish our pets, we cherish nature. And the land our church occupies is home to a, a wide diversity of animals of all kinds, birds, insects, reptiles, mammals. And we're really lucky enough, you might be able to see deer when you're in the fellowship hall. We recognize that this was once the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They were here long before the first Europeans came down the Peoria River. We celebrate them for who they were and for who they are today. I'd like to make a short public service announcement. Um, COVID numbers are rising. Please be careful. Make sure you're aware of what the numbers are in your area and uh, exercise caution when needed. Stay home if you're sick. Uh, I will warn you too that it's very hard to find COVID tests sometimes, and when you do, they're a little bit more expensive than they've been in the past. Now would be a good time to turn your devices to worship mode, otherwise known as silent. There's a slide to help you accomplish that. And I do want to tell you that there are some people who cannot turn their phones off. Phones are being used more and more for medical devices. My blood sugars are reported on my phone, so I have to leave my phone on. So if you hear somebody's phone go off, just give them some grace. It's always nice to have folks attend the service in the sanctuary, but sometimes that just isn't possible. At those times, you can live stream the service via Facebook. If the Sunday time doesn't work for you, you can find videos of past services and, uh, on YouTube and the audio of the sermons on our website. We have a number of things to help make you more comfortable. There's hearing de assist devices, a child safe area in the back that can crawl around on their tummies. Uh, there's fidgets to borrow and baskets in the back. So if there's anything you need, our ushers and our greeters are here to help. Please wear a name tag so we can all get to know each other. Once again, I've forgotten mine, so I'll just remind you, it's Jill Thomas. After the service, there's coffee and refreshments in the fellowship hall. It can, I've heard from a number of people that it's kind of intimidating to go back there. But there's a little table in the middle, or right as you go in the door, and it's for newcomers and members, and uh, I'm sure you'll find a warm welcome there. This is a very active church. There's services, classes, all kinds of activities and gatherings. To stay in touch with what's going on, we have a monthly newsletter called The Builder, a Friday flock note to tell you what's going on. And we have all kinds of uh, postings on uh, social media. Now I'm going to invite Jesse, who is our Director of Lifetime Religious Education, to come tell you about a couple special classes. Good 
You may know that we've started a series of classes for newcomers and those who just want to find out more about our church and what it's like to be a UU in general. Those cl classes happen on Sunday after worship, and today we have an inquirer's class. I'll be meeting with anybody who would like to join me in the conference room at noon. We'll talk about the history of the UU Church and touch on our values, our principles, our sources, and more. Hope to see you at one of the upcoming Faith Forward classes. You can all stand as you're willing and able. We'll sing our opening hymn to start our worship service. Love will guide us. I would like to invite Tony Huerta to give us our opening words this morning. Good morning. Our opening words are In Troubled Times by Stephen M. Schick. From the loneliness of troubled times we come to discover that we are not alone. Into the dwelling place of togetherness we come to collect remnants of hope. From fear that all is lost we come to discover what will save us. Into the comfort of each other's arms we come to feel the strength that has not yet vanished. From darkness we come to wait until our eyes begin to see. Into the refuge of fading dreams we come to remove illusions and focus new visions. From despair that walks alone we come to travel together. Into the dwelling place of generations we come to pledge allegiance to being peace and to doing justice. Our chalice lighting will be done by Kathy Carter. Yesterday, our distant ancestors gathered round a flame to share their stories and find comfort. Tomorrow, our descendants will gather round a flame, talking of a life we will never know. But today, it is we who gather here around this flame, seeking, believing, and being together.
The lighting of our candles mark our milestones in life. The candles we light may be a sign of hope, remembrance, loss, achievement. They mark something we are carrying in our hearts. I will light the first candle from the chalice flame. Then while Sherry plays some music for us, you are invited to come up and light a candle of your own. I have word from Mary Mulholland Kafar. Uh, she's sharing both a joy and a sorrow this morning about her wife, Marcia. She's sharing a joy because Marcia is out of pain and sorrow for herself because this is the first birthday since her death. This is the first time Mary has been apart from Marcia in 18 years. Today also is Marcia's birthday. She would have been 61. Yesterday, we held a celebration of life for Steve Moore. Steve was Amanda Franklin's father. In law, his in law was Chris Franklin, and his grandfather to Sadie and Piper. Reverend Jennifer conducted the service, and the caring committee provided a nice light lunch. 
we offer our condolences to the Franklin family during this time. One of the UU values is pluralism, where we Unitarians take meaning and consider sacred anything we find meaning. And when I was watching the Olympics opening ceremony, I was really touched by some words. It's Tony Estante, and he says, I would like to thank you, dear athletes. What a sight it is to see you all parading together. What a rare and precious moment you have given us. And even though the games cannot solve every problem, even though discrimination and conflicts are not about to disappear, tonight you have reminded us how beautiful humanity is when we all come together. When you return to the Olympic Village, you will be sending a message of hope to the world that there is a place where people of every nationality, every culture, and every religion can live together. You'll be reminding us it is possible. For the next 16 days, you will be the very best version of humanity. Now we'll take a moment of silence to mark those things that we carry in our hearts that never make it to our lips. Thank you. Now is the time that we sing the children out. They will be going to the uh, RE wing where Jesse has some fun things for them. Uh, the topic for today is sky. So let's sing the children out to their class. <laughs> financial contributions from those in the past have allowed us to be the liberal religious voice in Peoria today. A financial contribution today helps keep those current bills paid, and it helps us to fund the future. A gift not only helps our church, it helps our community as well through a custom called Share the Plate. With Share the Plate, one half of the cash offering from our Sunday collection plate is donated to a local charity which practices UU values. This month, our Share the Plate recipient is Hope Renewed Youth Conference. HRYC, as it's known, provides scholarships and deserving candidates in the professions of teaching and law enforcement. The recipients commit to working in the community after they complete college. Ideally, this will help change the culture in both, uh, of both professions, allowing for more people of color and by developing an investment in the community from both working and living in it. This is a charity and relies solely on fundraising and donations. You may put cash in, in the offertory plate or a check. You can indicate if it's for a pledge, a split with the charity and church, or you can also use the QR code on the back of the order of service. Thank you for your, your generosity of time, energy, and finances to support our liberal religious tradition. Will the ushers please come forward and collect the offertory? Thank you. 
Kiefhofer has been a regular speaker at summer services since we first switched from a lecture-based format to a worship service format. He and his wife, Kathy, are very dedicated to this. You may remember Kathy gave us a presentation on the different speakers that the church has had in the past. Brad's favorite topic, usually lean more to pop culture and what it tells about us ourselves. In past services, he's spoken about Sherlock Holmes, zombies, Darth Vader, and teddy bears. Very eclectic. This time, his topic is the time travel of our lives. Please welcome Brad Kiefhofer. Now, as Jill was saying, if you've come to any of the ones where I've done this before, usually I'm finding some inspiration from a TV show or movie I saw during the spring when she was asking what the topic was going to be. This year I was watching this TV show called Outer Range, which is about modern ranchers in Wyoming, which is because people like shows about ranchers in Wyoming these days. But the thing that made this show different was people kept falling through this hole and traveling through time and winding up in the wrong era. Now, we, we've seen a lot of books, movies, TV shows about people lost in time over the years. I mean, they go way back. You know, there's things like Outlander, Quantum Leap, Somewhere in Time. You can go back to Mark Twain at a Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. It was always a favorite. I mean, I could stand here and ramble off titles for a very long time. You know, we've even... There was a time, we had a time machine sitting right over there by the piano for a church service, and Lydia Moss Bradley came out of it and talked to everybody. That was interesting, among other people from the past. So, you know, time travel in this church have had, had their connection over the years. Because people who are displaced in time are fascinating characters for us. And I think the reason for that is because every one of us, if we're lucky enough, become a character displaced in time. We become thrown forward in time. We're time traveling every second of every minute of every day, but only in one direction. We don't tend to think of ourselves as time travelers, but every one of us is exactly that. One of the earliest classics of time travel is a short story written in 1819, where the time traveler doesn't use a machine he just gets drunk and passes out and then wakes up 20 years later. While he was sleeping, the American Revolution took place. Children became adults. His wife died. And apparently, it was the ghosts of Captain Henry Hudson's crew of sailors that he had been drinking with before he took his long nap. That story, you might remember, is Rip Van Winkle by Washington Irving. Like Rip Van Winkle, a lot of us present today have lived in one world and then woken up about 20 years later. The only difference between us and Rip Van Winkle is he woke up once. We go wake up like seven or 8,000 times before the 20 years passes. But 20 years passed for us just like it did for Rip Van Winkle, and the world did change certainly for us like it did him. And Many of us have time traveled a lot longer than Rip Van Winkle's 20 years. 40, 50, 60, 20 is really not all that long. A lot of us who remember the 1980s know that a lot has changed in the last four years, but we're not the first people ever to be put in that kind of spot. A hundred years ago, in the year 1924, folks remembered the, the 1880s, and they were kind of in the same boat we're in now. I mean, I'm kind of into that because, as you mentioned, Sherlock Holmes is one of my favorite things. And the Sherlock Holmes stories originally came out in the late 1880s, 1890s, and they took place in that time in the Victorian era. That was this period where London was the greatest city in the world, capital of this global empire that England had. There were horse-drawn cabs clip-clopping down the streets. There were gas lamps instead of electric lights on the streets. Newspapers and postal deliveries came many times a day because that was their main form of communication. 
everything delivered by hand, even telegrams where they had to go from one station to another station and somebody had to pick up the message in one line, type it into another thing for another line. The cables back then had to have little human inter interactions in them, even just to get you know their telegrams around. If you wanted music in the 1880s, someone had to play it or sing it for you. If you wanted to see a show, someone had to perform it for you. And you know, books, well, books have always been around, so they don't change that much. But for people that came 40 years later in the 1920s, all that stuff they remembered 40 years ago earlier was almost gone. Telephones, motor cars, electric lights, even radio were taking over. World War I took the steam out of a lot of the global powers. And things like prohibition and the roaring 20s were changing the way society itself worked. So it was no wonder that people in the 1920s really liked the Sherlock Holmes stories because they were this world that they remembered 40 years ago. So, you know, they, because it, things had changed, they were in a very different place, which is kind of where we find ourselves now in 2024 with many of us looking back four or five decades and going, what happened? I mean, you remember it? Some of us remember typing on a mechanical machine that used no electricity at all to make a letter. It's just your finger muscles causing the steel type to hit a ribbon soaked in ink and print one character at a time on that paper. And you know, if you were really good, well, you could do 40 words a minute or more just to get things done. And when you were done typing that letter, you had to put it in an envelope, take it to the post office, you know, you remember the post office, that place where the advertisements and the Amazon packages come from now. And what was even harder back then was if you wanted to send some pictures of your grandkids to your grand, you know, grandkids to grandparents, you had to get out a camera, take the picture, take the film from the camera to the drugstore, wait for the drugstore to develop it, go back to the drugstore, pick up the pictures, and put them in the envelope with your typed letter, take that to the post office, and mail it which could take a week or more. And it's something that right now I could stand here during this and not lose any time and do the exact same thing on my phone in like less than 30 seconds. And that's just in the last 40 years. It's like things have changed so much. We have all time traveled from a period like that, a different time to now. You know, everything changes. It's like I always, even with the, you know, mailing the words up. You sat down and watched TV 40 years ago. You had your choice of three shows on three networks, and you had to be there right at the hour to get when the show started, because if you weren't there when the show started, you were out of luck. And you know you could have somebody call and remind you to go watch the show on the hour when the team thing, but that meant somebody had to not be using your telephone and not be using their telephone, because that was the only way you were getting through. And there were always some people in households that just wanted to hang on the phone. Now, but you didn't come here to hear me rant about how things are different today. You, you know, we all know this. We just don't stop and think about it sometimes. And we can't go back to those earlier times. That's the one kind of time travel we really haven't figured out yet, and that might be a good thing. Because I have this theory about the first person who's ever going to travel back in time. And they aren't gonna go back to like a big moment in history they aren't going to go back to try and change things. What they're probably going to do, if my theory is correct, is they're going to go to a restaurant that isn't around anymore. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have a long list. I mean, Jumer's Castle Lodge, Ned Kelly's Steakhouse, Dave and Irvita's Lums, Bishop's Buffet, Peppy Taco, Heritage House Sports Board, Garcia's Pizza, Skewer Inn, Hofbrau. I mean, I could go on and on. I'd love just going to a McDonald's in 1975 and getting 1975 McDonald's food. because It's not the same now as it was then. But we don't have backwards time travel, and that's probably a good thing. I mean, if we had a time machine right here, and we all said, oh, let's go to Bishop's Buffet for lunch back in 18, 1980, then it would probably be real crowded, and our past selves couldn't get in to find out it was a good restaurant. So that's, that's really the biggest and the first rule of time travel, you can't go backwards. 
All time streams lead to the future. The future, you know, can be a little scary because we don't know what's coming. I mean, and I'm not talking about aliens who want to plant eggs in your chest or robots who decide people have become a problem or something even crazier than that, like a game show host becoming president. It's the little things that really make me nervous. <laughs> now, remember, I, I said earlier, Mark Twain's a Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's court. Now, there's been a movie or two based on it. It's older, so you might not be too familiar with remember it real well, but there was a time traveler in that story who went back to King Arthur's time and he got a lucky break because he was instantly the one person on, who was the best expert on the sciences and mechanics on the whole planet because he went back in time like that. Forward in time works a little differently. Now there was an old 1966 TV show, maybe you remember it, maybe not because it wasn't very big. It was kind of like Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, but it was made by the people that made Gilgan's Island. And it was called It's About Time. Anybody remember that one? No. It was only one season. It didn't last long. It was about some astronauts that went up into space, and when they came back down, they wound up in caveman times. So they spent all their little episodes trying to teach the caveman how to, like, make a slingshot or do something else like that because they were you know, the smartest people on the planet in that time. But about halfway through the seas first season, and the only season, they got back in the spaceship and they took the cavemen into the modern day. So then the comedy revolved around the cavemen trying to figure out how to do things in the modern world. Now, I don't want to say that we're more like the cavemen in that show than the astronauts, but all of us come from a simpler time when things were you know, a lot less complicated, and we're transported to a future we aren't really prepared for. I mean, this stupid phone. Do any of us know how this thing works and how everything on it works and everything we can do with it? I mean, I don't know anybody who really has mastered it. You know, we have these programs we use like Photoshop and Excel that, I mean, you can do the basics, but mastering one of those things, I don't know anybody had, you know, there's, a rare person. I can't even tell you, you know, if anybody can tell me which channel is streaming the James Bond movies, that would be a big help. I can't even figure that out. It's, you know, it's a very complicated world we're in now. Things are moving fast and we're constantly expected to learn new things just to keep up and keep going. I mean, that's not so unreasonable. I mean, well, it's, I mean, you can look at that whole thing and the steady stream of change we're facing and decide to plant your feet. I mean, some people do that. Maybe not going full Amish, abstaining from technology, but just going, this is it. I'm not learning anything else. I'm done. Which, you know, we all want to retire from work someday. And, you know, many of us have. It's, it's a nice thing. You just, but you, this is a job that you can't retire from. It's, you know, the world keeps churning, you gotta kinda keep up with it. There was one fellow I know that just went, you know, once the internet started happening, he said, well, I'm just gonna be a Luddite, I'm not doing email. And he stuck by it. Only problem was, his wife had to print out the emails to him and let him read them, and then he would say what his answer would, write it down, and then she would type in his answer and send the email back for him, which, I mean, he was a guy that used, was used to being a boss and having secretaries and stuff, so that was just part of his bad habits, I think. But he got someone else to deal with the future for him. Now, you know, it's, it's easy to look at that guy and go, well, thank heavens I'm not like that. But we really can't help but be like that to a degree. I mean, can I build this thing from scratch? No, I, I can't. I had to depend on somebody to make this for me. I mean. We're all just a little bit. My, my old neighbor used to hold up his iPhone like that and go, who came up with this? Who invented this? And I had to stop and explain to him. It wasn't like Thomas Edison or Alexander Graham Bell where one guy went, oh, I'll make a cell phone. And then we had cell phones. It's like, no. It's like none of these people, I mean, even those guys, they were building on other people's work. All of our modern devices are from innovations built on other innovations, built 
other layers of innovations from ideas on top of ideas. Creators inspire creators and help other creators. Humanity is a hive mind. As much as we like to pretend we're individuals and lone wolves and whatever, we're really ants swarming. If you've never seen an ant swarm over an obstacle, you know, they push each other, they climb over each other, they work together to swarm up and get over whatever it is. And that's kind of the way we time travel. We make it to the future as a whole. We rode right here on a wave created by generations before us, generations that built upon what they were handed and changing the world. Even now, that's, that's constantly happen, happening. One of the things I always thought was funny about time travel in the future, when you show the future, you'd have people living in space houses or you know, the Jetsons lived up in, in the sky on these things and stuff. There was always these fancy new places to live. Anybody with any experience, the world knows the houses don't change. You know, everything else changes. The houses stay the same. You go over to Europe, you see houses that are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, so much older than anything in America. I mean, very few of us live in houses that we built or had built for us. We move into houses that were built by someone who came before, generations before. And generational change is what pushes us ahead, which is one of the hardest things we have to deal with. Because, you know, you think of generations in terms of pop culture, the music, the clothes, the slang. There's more to it. There's all those little things that it takes to exist in the current world. Now, I had two very different grandfathers growing up. One fished and hunted and gardened and did everything possible to ensure a steady supply of food on the table, having grown up in the Depression. He was always a little worried about me and my siblings that we didn't have those skills. And now that I've reached his age, that he was then, when he was worrying about me, I've started worrying about the next generation and their supply chain, the ghost kitchens, meal delivery kits, things my grandpa couldn't have imagined because they're not doing things the way I did them coming up. They're not going to the grocery store all the time and doing all the same things. My other grandfather worried about me in a little different way because it became plain to him that my faith wasn't the same as his faith and I didn't, maybe didn't have a good path to keep me from going astray. Now that I'm his age, I look at my nieces and nephews and some of them have different faiths than what I have and I'm like, kind of like about you guys, I'm worried about you. <laughs> but we always worry about the people we love and that they're not following the path that we followed because that's the path we know from the world we came from. The routes that took us to get to where we are were based on the things around us, the time we were in then. The generations that come after us have to find their own paths and use what tools are available to them, what's serving them best. If they want to listen to a song to lift their spirits, they can't pull out their cassette mixtape and put it into their Sony Walkman and go through that. That was worked best in 1979, but now it's pretty inefficient and you know you got the phone, everything comes back to that. I mean, and it's even taste and stuff. We might want to get a kid to watch Star Wars because we thought it was the greatest thing ever in the summer of 1977. But since then. They just watched 10 years worth of Marvel superheroes pop out of portals in a movie in 2019 and were way impressed with that. So they're not going to see Lightspeed kick on and go, whoa, Lightspeed, because they've seen bigger things in their movies. And right now, even that 2019 movie is kind of past us as well. We all like to think the things of our time are the classics and will never change. And a few things do trickle through but the world changes, everything moves on. And we have to allow those next generations to be who they are. And thinking about this future that's constantly coming at us, you know, I said the first rule was you can't go back in time. Okay, but I was trying to think of other, if in time traveling forward, what kind of rules, what kind of philosophies would we want to adapt? And at that point I realized the best course, I mean, Star Wars, I talk about, you know, 
I thought Star Wars was great back in the day. All that, you know, Force Jedi's, all that stuff. But that's not a good place to pull any philosophy from. If you're going to go with a star thing to pull philosophies from, you got to go to Star Trek. Now, Star Trek started out as a five year mission, turned into a continuing mission. Now it's lasted almost 60 years of our time, and it's, it's still around. I mean, that's, that's a lot of traveling through time, even though Captain Kirk always said space was the final frontier. I don't think he was right. I think time is the final frontier. Uh, but the mission statement of the Starship Enterprise continues to be some of the best advice we have as time travelers heading into the future. To explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Boldly go doesn't just mean new planets. Remember how I, I was saying I'd like a time machine to go back to old restaurants? Well, sometimes being bold is just going to new restaurants and new food trucks and seeking out new stuff. Sometimes boldly going is just Googling a new word you just heard because even that little thing makes you an explorer. The Earth of 2024 is a big, big place, and there's a lot to learn about even just here in Peoria. You might have to be a little bold to boldly go into all those parts of the future we haven't seen yet, all those doors we haven't opened yet. And yet, you know, you don't know. And some of the doors might not be all that great. Sometimes things take a turn, whether it's from nature or some you know, bad people. But we always have to take that next step, and the one after that, and the one after that. Because we're time travelers, every single one of us, like it or not. We're going to travel through time into a future that's quite different from this one. And if you think of time, uh, think of a future like a destination city that you're headed to next week to visit, you might think of it that way and go, oh, maybe I need to plan a little bit. It's more than just planning. You need to prepare yourself eternal, internally. Like if you were going to take a trip, you'd go, oh, I'm going to get on a plane. I have to you know, get myself ready to get on a plane because that's not something for the cowardly. We all have little issues there. And, you know, there's always going to be surprises. You don't know what's coming at you. That's the thing. Because like the crew of the USS Enterprise, we're all about to boldly go where no one has gone before. So when you walk out that door today, you're on your way to a Sunday afternoon in August 4th, 2024 in Peoria, Illinois, where nobody's been before. Nobody's seen that place. It's kind of exciting. And I hope you all find something good there because, and you know, in all your future time travels as well, because that's where we're all headed. So, thanks for coming and listening to me babble today. And let's make the future and make the most of this future that the day is holding for us. Thank you. So with that, I'm going to ask you to stand as you're willing and able, and we'll have our closing hymn, number 295. <laughs>
like to invite Pat Denzer to come up and extinguish our chalice for us. Chalice reading comes from Move Through the World in Love by Maggie Lovins. We extinguish this flame, but not its meaning and mission in our hearts. Our time together has come to an end. Go in peace and be of service to one another, and may you move through the world in love for all your days. Sharing Our Blessings by Adam Slate. We end our gathering with gratitude for camaraderie, shared wisdom, goodwill, and support that we extend to each other within this community. May we continue to bless each other with these gifts, and may we reflect those blessings back into the world as we administer, as we administer to those around us. So be it. Thank you.